Well, welcome to part two of our exploration of Christmas, what really happened. And before we start, let's do something radical. Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the lengths that you've gone to that we might have life and life abundant. We pray, Father, that in this hour we would get more insights as to what you've done here for us. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit you would help us to apply these things to our understanding and our walk that we might be more effective for you as we commit ourselves without any reservation in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, part two of the story of Christmas, what really happened, and we're going to explore the visit of the Magi. Now, few people really understand what was going on there. That led, of course, to the massacre at Bethlehem and uh, the flight to Egypt and uh, the return to Nazareth uh, to, for his childhood years. And we're going to discover, much to many people's surprise, that those years are, in fact, recorded in the Scripture as we explore some subtleties in Psalm 69. But the whole fabric here needs an understanding of the empires. To get into the materials we want to get into, you need to have a little bit of political understanding of the, well, the geopolitical landscape of that time. The Babylonian Empire rose to power about 606 B.C. and was taken over by the Persians in 539. The city Babylon became an empire under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar's very bright general, Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, he established the, 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 the Babylonian Empire, which then, of course, gets... Uh, absorbed by the Persian Empire, and uh, the, there is a group within the Persian Empire that we need to understand called the Magi. That's a Latinized form of Magoi, an ancient Greek transliteration of the Persian, the Persian original, uh, where we rely a lot on Herodotus to get some insight who these Magi really were. We find an interesting title in Jeremiah, the Rabmag, which is the chief of the Magi. That was in Nebuchadnezzar's court. There was a counterfeit group, if you will, imitators, if you will, in Babylon later. But the Magi were a hereditary priesthood uh, among the Medes. And uh, Daniel is appointed by, uh, as, uh, uh, over that hereditary priesthood. Now, we'll talk more about that priesthood, but get the picture as we move in this that the priesthood was hereditary of the Medes, but Daniel gained favor with Darius, and Darius put him in charge of this hereditary priesthood. Now, you can imagine how that went over to, with them. And that's what, probably what led to the chicanery that ended up in the lion's den incident in Daniel chapter 6. That was their way of trying to put an end to that. But if, as you study the Magi in Herodotus, their key skill was not astrology. It was dream interpretation and iromancy. And that was their key skill. And that's going to be very important to understand as we go forward here. And uh, the, 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 uh, in the Medo-Persian world, uh, Darius the Great um, recognized that the Magi were very, very skilled at dream interpretation. And so he and they, they, they were atta attached to the court. And they become the kin kingmakers. They were a combination priest and magistrate combination. That's where we get the word magistrate from the Magi. And uh, they were not originally followers of Zoroaster. Uh, you can check that out in uh, Britannic and others. Many sources on Persia are, don't go back far enough to really appreciate that, that the original um, religion was different. And uh, it's interesting how similar the Magi were to the Jewish forms of worship. They each had a monotheistic concept of one beneficent creator, um, author of all good and opposed by all that's evil. And each had a hereditary priesthood. The Jews had their Levites and the Persians had their Magi, if you will. And uh, they had one mediator between God and man and uh, they made their th uh, things by a blood sacrifice. And uh, each depended on divination from their priesthood. Each had the same essential concepts of clean and unclean. Each involved hereditary priesthood and... Uh, the, uh, uh, and that continues. As you go through the per history of Persia, you'll discover that there's a real synergism between Persia and uh, Israel. 
Uh, many of the Persian kings were actually of Jewish blood. And so the, since the days of Daniel, the fortunes of, of both Persia and the Jewish nation are intertwined. And they both had their turn falling under the Seleucid Empire, which is the remnants of the Greek Empire, but they both were able to get free. The Jews under the Maccabean leadership and the Persians under a, a, a dominating group that led to the Parthian Empire. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the rival to Rome to the east was Parthia, the Parthian Empire. It's important to understand that, to understand what was going on at the visit of the Magi. And uh, it was at that time during the Parthian Empire that the Magi this clique of priest uh, administrators were the ones that made the king. They determined who the king would be. They, they had all the top governmental offices. They composed the upper house in, 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 of their council, of the magistanes as they call them, which I think is, that's where the term magistrate came from. And uh, uh, their, their duties included the absolute choice of the king of the realm. And that's going to impact Herod's reaction when they arrive. And so... It's this dual capacity of priest and counselor that both the civil and the political and religious council get connected in the Persian environment. So they became the supreme priestly caste of the Persian Empire. There is an inscription that has the same role that the Rosetta Stone does. The Rosetta Stone is a, a block that you can handle. The, the inscription on Behistun is a huge wall, like a billboard, that is, it was done by Darius the Great, but it also has everything there in three languages, the Elamite, the Akkadian, and the Old Persian or Aramaic. And because of that, that's how we can learn about these. It, it's the link by which we can translate these other languages, just as the Rosetta Stone has served that purpose. And it speaks of the, the particular thing that has to do with a, a, a speedy and final triumph over a revolt of Magi that got out of hand back in 522 B.C. But in any case, after the... After the uh, uh, Persian Empire comes Greek under Alexander the Great. We have the Greek Empire. And then when he, Alexander dies, it, four of his generals divide it up. Cassandra takes the far west. Lysimachus takes that area that you and I think of as Turkey. Seleucus took the, east, took the east and Ptolemy to the south. The two gorillas on the block, really, were Seleucus and Ptolemy. And what joins them is that little strip of Israel, which is really a buffer state. And it's the subsequent struggles between the dynasties of the north and the dynasties of the south that populate the, most, the bulk of the uh, 11th chapter of Daniel. The so-called silent years. You know, I've you know, got a lot of books in my library that talks about the silent years between the Old and New Testament. It turns out they're, you know, they're presumably they're not in the Bible, except they are. <laughs> they are written in advance in, in, in Daniel 11 from verses 5 through 35. And it's, it is so precise that some of the critics have said it had to be written later because it really chronicles, in effect, the struggles between Ptolemy and the Seleucus, their, their descent, their relative dynasties. But we're all familiar with the Roman Empire that succeeds the Greek Empire. And we often, often forget that it consists of two legs. The eastern leg outlasts the western leg a thousand years. But what most of us don't recognize is, unless we've studied it, is that while Rome was making its mark, the remnants of the Persian Empire from about 250 B.C. to about 224 was in its heyday, the, was the Parthian Empire. And this zone that we think of as the Fertile Crescent and what have you is really a buffer between the vicissitudes of both empires, between uh, Rome and Parthia. And you need to understand that to understand what was going on at the time of the birth of Christ. It was a, uh, it was a, it's now in what we call Iran and Afghanistan. They were Scythians, uh, uh, actually. They adopted Median dress and Aryan speech. They were, they were subject successfully to Assyrians, Medes, Persians, and Macedonians under Alexander the Great and finally the Seleucids. In about 250 B.C., the Parthians succeeded in founding an independent kingdom. And... Um, during the first century B.C., it grew into an empire extending from the Euphrates all the way to the Indus uh, River, to the, uh, to the Indian Ocean, basically. And uh, so that's the Parthian Empire. And uh, Judea is, of course, a buffer zone. And so Parthia, in a sense of speaking, is a rival to Rome and had several successes, major successes against Rome. 
when, they, when these two powers clashed. Pompey, the first Roman conqueror of Jerusalem in 63 BC, had attacked the Armenian outpost of Parthia. That's on the, that would be the western edge of this emergent empire. And uh, in 55 BC, Crassus led the Roman legions in sacking Jerusalem and in a subsequent attack on Parthia proper. The Romans were decisively defeated in the Battle of Carre uh, with a loss of 30,000 troops, including their commander. So the Romans got really clobbered by the Parthians in that engagement. And they, the Parthians counterattacked with a token invasion of Armenia, Syria, and Palestine. So realize that Judea then is really under, Par, under, under the Parthian thumb for a while. Nominal Ro, Roman rule was reestablished under Antipater, who was the father of Herod. So the father of Herod, the King Herod we're going to talk about, um, reestablished for Rome from the Parthians for a while. Um, and who, uh, and uh, yet he had to retreat before a Parthian invasion in 40 B.C. Mark Antony reestablished Roman sovereignty in 37 B.C., but like Carson's before him, he embarked on a similarly ill-fated Parthian expedition. He goes against Parthia and gets clobbered again. So Parthia is not to be messed with, okay? His disastrous retreat was followed by another wave of invading Parthians, which swept all Roman opposition completely out of Palestine. Need to understand, Palestine was Parthian, not Roman. Roman would claim it, but Parthian really had it, okay? And Herod himself succeeds in getting the title King of the Jews from the head of the Roman Empire, but it's for three years he can't go there. It's too dangerous. So he's king of, the, he's king of a province that he's not safe for him to show up in, okay? And so... Now, with Parthian collaboration, the Jewish sovereignty was restored and Jerusalem was fortified with a Jewish garrison. Herod, by this time, had secured his, you know, from Augustus Caesar, the title King of the Jews. But it was not for three years, and it took a five-month siege by Roman troops that he was able to occupy his capital city. You need to understand the slippery rock he's on, okay? So Parthia is the, the, is the big gorilla right in the neighborhood. And so, um, now you see, he had gained the, the, the rule or throne of a rebellious buffer state that was stuck between two contending empires. <laughs> Not a very enviable position. At any time, his own subjects might conspire in bringing the Parthians to their aid. Remember, Herod was not Jewish. He was an Edomian, an Edomite, which is an enemy of the Jews. And, he, and, and the Jews were very comfortable with the Parthians, so they could have easily at any time conspired against him. So he's a nervous Nelly here. He's justifiably paranoid, okay? Now Augustus himself was very old by now, and Rome, since the t t retirement of um, Tiberius, was without any experienced military commander. That's got to make them a little concerned in the outlying districts too. Now uh, Armenia is very pro-Parthian, and they were fomenting, fomenting a... Uh, revolt against Rome, which two years later they actually succeeded doing. At the time of the birth of Christ, Herod may have been close to his final illness too. He dies very shortly thereafter. Now Parthia, by the way, is very powerful, but it has its own problems internally at this time. It was ripe for another invasion to their buffer provinces, except Parthia itself was racked with internal consensions. Phraates IV was very unpopular, aging king. He had been deposed once before, and it was not improbable that the, the Persian Magi were already positioning the politics for his successor. That's obviously something that everybody was watching. So this is a very precarious visit. So Herod finds that these Magi, and this isn't three guys on camels, this is a major military force. They're accompanied with cavalry. At this time, the Magi, in their dual priestly and governmental office, bear in mind, they're like the senior senate of, of Persia, were um, uh, uh, probably positioning the choice and election of the, their next king, all right? And so these are the guys that are entering Jerusalem. The scripture tells us the whole city was upset. The whole city of Jerusalem wouldn't be upset with three guys on camels. No, there is a major Parthian uh, group, uh, uh, you know, entourage that's arrived. And Herod is nervous. 
It's conceivable, the kind of uh, hallway gossip would be, that they, they might have been taking advantage of the king's lack of popularity in, 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 in uh, Persia to um, further their own interests and establish a new dynasty in Persia, for all he knew, if a, a, you know, a sufficiently strong contender could be found. So we get to Matthew chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, wise men, doesn't say kings, wise men, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? I'll show you why that's a put down. But anyway, for we have seen his star in the east and we are come to worship him. And Herod the king had heard these things. He was troubled. He was troubled. He recognized there's an implied threat here somehow. Here the king heard these things. He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with them. All Jerusalem was tense. Get the picture here. There's the Parthian Empire, and they have sent this entourage to chase down this guy that was born king of the Jews. You're probably traveling in force. With, you can just imagine the Asian style of pomp and ceremony here. And obviously with adequate military because this is a hostile buffer zone they're entering. And uh, so he was shook up. And uh, now, if you understand the background, you can understand why he's upset. The first question in the New Testament was where, in the New Testament, is, where is he that's born in the kingdom of the Jews? That's the first question in the New Testament. First question in the Old Testament is, God called Adam, where art thou? <laughs> Interesting. The first question in the Old Testament deals with the first Adam. The first question in the New Testament deals with the last Adam, whether they realized it or not. Continuing, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then they quote Micah 5 2 to the king. The king's called his staff guys. Hey, check the records. Where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? They check the records. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. The reason he's going to be born in Bethlehem is because of the book of Ruth, but I'm going to get into that here. Okay. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art, thou, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. That's the way it's quoted there. Let's take a look how it's quoted in your Bible. Micah 5, 2. You've seen it on every Christmas card. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel's, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This is the preeminent one that's going to be born as a man. Then Herod, <laughs> when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. That's so we can set the executioner's rules of engagement. Huh? He sent them to Bethlehem. He said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. <laughs> you don't need worship like that he had planned. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. We'll touch on that in a minute. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with Exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, notice they're in a house now. They're no longer in the stable. This could be a year later. Who knows? And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And because there's three gifts, everybody jumps to the conclusion there were three guys. No, it could have been 20 guys, or it could have been two guys. And we don't know, uh, this was the only gifts. There may have been other gifts. I mean, somehow, the, the, you see, we j always jump to conclusions. Anyway, after being warned of God in a dream, notice the oniromancy thing here. He, 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 he communicated to them in a, in a manner that they'd be most comfortable with. After being warned of God in a dream, they, they uh, should not return to Herod. They departed into their own country another way. Okay, now these are not, these are not necessarily all that were mentioned. These are mentioned because they're prophetic Gold speaks of his deity. Frankincense was an a, um, incense used for priestly duties. It's mixed with the showbread by the priests and so forth. And myrrh, when crushed, is an ointment for burial. So you have his role here, prophet, priest, and king. These three gifts are prophetic. That's why they're distinguished. There may have been other gifts too, for all we know. 
prophet, priest, and king. Now, it's interesting, these magi, that we've looked at what the Scripture says, and we have a little bit of perspective of the political, geopolitical environment. It's interesting to see the incredible traditions that have risen around these magi. In the Eastern Church, there weren't three, there are twelve. And uh, Christmas is twelve days. Twelve days of Christmas. Their Christmas is January 6th, not December 25th. But again, that's just an Eastern, East, Eastern Orthodox tradition. In about the third century, these wise men suddenly become kings bearing gifts. And the reason they do that, in part, is because of Psalm 72, which goes on about how the kings of the world are going to come and give him gifts, Me, probably meaning the millennium. But they figure they, that's why they're calling these wise. They figure maybe this is a fulfillment. They, call, they start calling him kings. In the West, Western tradition, most of us are derivative from the Reformation, probably, and, uh, and thus derivative from the medieval church. There are three of these because there were three gifts. Christmas is December 25th for the reasons we reviewed earlier. And uh, what some churches call epiphany occurs on January 6th. The way some ch the church traditions are, he was, he's born December 25th, but the wise men show up on January 6th. That's sort of the way the, 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 the picture that's often portrayed. The, the, uh, the shepherds in the field were probably that night, for all we know. But the wise men could have come a year later. They're still there. They apparently got a rented house now, and they're managing somehow. Okay. In the 6th century... Now, we're going a lot of, several hundred years ago by, 6th century, uh, in, a, in a 6th century chronicle, these three guys now have names all of a sudden. Bethesaria, which becomes Belthazar, Melchior, or Melchior, and Gathasba, Gasper. So the, 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 what derives from this is the three names you sometimes find in literature, like even uh, Lou Wallace, uh, when he wrote uh, Ben-Hur, he, he was governor of Mexico, Governor of New Mexico, he uh, uh, he gives them those names. You know, he he does that. And he 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 builds on that tradition. In the seventh century, these three become representative of Asia, Africa, and Europe by representing the three sons of Noah: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Makes interesting patterning. Now, this ignores the fact they're all Medes. <laughs> okay. But set that aside, this is the colorful traditions that occur. And who knows, maybe they had some linkage, but this is just church tradition. When you get to the 14th century, you now the Armenians add uh, a, a slight twist to all this. Balthazar becomes the king of Arabia, Melchior becomes the king of Persia, and Gaspar becomes the king of India. So they become three kings of Arabia, Persia, and India, which is, you know, that's their perception from Armenia. Um, so, for what it's worth. Okay. Well, what about the star? You know, every time you go to a planetarium show, uh, they always have some, especially around Christmas time, they always have some conjectures. They'll go through all these conjunctions and eclipses and various attempts to speculate on what the star of Bethlehem might be, missing the whole point, in my opinion. I was a member of the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. I made astronomy a hobby for many years, and I have little patience with most of those conjectures because they're provably wrong. But... Uh, some of them do tie, try to tie it to Balaam's prophecy. And, uh, but it's interesting that Balaam's prophecy says there'll be a star out of Jacob. It's interesting that Matthew did not quote that, which causes me to not be too enthusiastic about trying to link that as the star of Bethlehem, if you will. Uh, also, uh, were these conjunctions? And I don't think so for a number of reasons. It was Kepler, the astronomer, that first suggested the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces in 7 B.C. Well, one of the problems there, it's a little early, about five years too soon. And uh, all this gets confused because of an erroneous inference from Josephus, who had the wrong, which led to the wrong date anyway. But the main point of this, I think, that we miss is, it was not a natural phenomenon. That if, it was, if you could prove it was a natural phenomenon, it destroys its significance. Its significance because it was supernatural. It led them there, and it settled over the spot. This is the Lord's answer to GPS, I guess. I, anyway, I suspect something that I have never seen in the commentary, but my, my conjecture is that it was the Shekinah. We see that at the creation. It brooded over the waters. It's the, uh, at the Abrahamic covenant. It passed through the, uh, uh, the uh, um, split offering in Genesis 15. We see it at the burning bush. I think that was the Shekinah. The pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. 
I think we see it individualized in the flames at Pentecost. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit in his visible form. God's glory. Why not here? Why wouldn't this be the same thing? Announcing, designating the Messiah. The creator himself became man and dwelt among us. Wouldn't surprise me at all. It would digni- it would, it's, you want to, where's the star in Bethlehem? I think it's the Holy Spirit in, its, in a visible form. Anyway. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Boy, there's a warning, huh? Which, of course, they jump on. And he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed in Egypt. In other words, they split as soon as the wise men split. Because Herod is going to, Herod now has been alarmed. He's going to try to do something about this. So they're in Egypt. They were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken out of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, this is one of those prophetic references that we do well to consider more deeply. Because you can quickly discover, okay, that's in, in the book of Hosea. But I think we'll learn some things about this. In Hosea chapter 11, first verse, when Israel was a child, I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. If you look at this in the context of the verses preceding and following, you'll quickly discover that this passage is about national Israel. It's a stretch to say, gee, this is messianic. But Matthew tells us it is messianic. Why? Because Matthew's Jewish and he understands that pattern is prophecy. And that's what he's all about. Pattern is prophetic. In Exodus 4, verse 22, Israel, that's where it first speaks of Israel as a nation, but it speaks of that nation as if it's God's son. He uses that idiom. All through Isaiah, the thought shifts between the nation and the Messiah, all the way through. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, Abraham is the friend of God, and Israel spoken of as, a, is, as if the nation was an individual. And here, it's, uh, in that passage, it's uh, Israel, my servant. In chapter 42, the spirit upon him, the subject changed, no longer referring to the nation, but now the Messiah. See, there's a, a, an antiphonal uh, style in Isaiah where it's the nation one minute, it's the Messiah the next. And so the, the Jew understands that, and that's why he see, can see these things as prophetic. That's why they study their history in terms of anticipating the future. And Isaiah 52, verse 13, and Isaiah 53 is perhaps the, the peak of all of that. Now, the Jews interpret that chapter nationally, and they deny that it refers to the Messiah because it's too indicting of, of, of the rejection of the New Testament Christ. Well, that leads us to a very interesting character by the name of Kaduri. Itzhak Kaduri, I want you to understand who he is. He's one, he, was, he was one of the most prominent ultra-Orthodox rabbis and ultra-Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox in Israel. How uh, uh, unique was he? When he died, he happened to be 108. Some say he may be even older. Um, and some records say over 300,000 came to his funeral. He died uh, uh, more than a year ago. And he died in February 2006. And I put 200,000, because that's the Israel Today number, but I've heard other reports that it was 300,000, whatever. But so here's what's interesting. A few months before he died, he wrote a small note which he requested should be remained sealed for a year after his death. Kind of a strange procedure. You under, we now understand why he did that. Here's the note. Because, you know, one year after his death, they opened the note and it made the front pages of the, certainly the national press there. What it says is regarding the Rishi Tevot of the Mashiach, he will lift up the people and prove that his word and law are valid, written with my signature in the month of Rakhimim uh, 5765. Yitzhak Kaduri. Now, this was April 7, 2007. This is in the paper. What you, you don't pick up unless you're in a, a Kabbalist like he was. You take the first letter of each word there in the Hebrew, and it, it indicates that the, that the name of the Messiah is Yehoshua or Yeshua. This has rattled the ultra-Orthodox community because they understand what he was doing. 
In Judaism, it is considered poor form to speak ill of someone who's been dead for less than a year. So the, after one year, you don't do you, you, he, he, he has veneration. And so he had this note sealed until one year after his death, knowing the bomb it would drop on the ultra-Orthodox community. Because he left a legacy that was on a Jewish website that we picked up on from some friends there. He said, the spirit of the Messiah is the spirit of prophecy. That's a quote from Revelation 19.10, by the way. A person is conceived by the Messiah and contains the spirit of the Messiah when he meets the Messiah. That's, we call that the new birth. True believers in the Messiah will draw others to the testimony of the Messiah and will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's a quote of, from the Sermon on the Mount. He says there, you know, that Jews speak of two Messiahs, the Messiah, son of uh, Yosef, and the, Messiah, the Mashiach, son, uh, the son of uh, David. He, say, he says something the Christians have been saying all along, that those two are the same. It's not two Messiahs, it's two comings of the same Messiah. And... Uh, but it's interesting that uh, uh, he, uh, he also says he's seen the Messiah and was saved. Now, that's not a, a vocabulary that they use in Judaism. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. He quotes from Isaiah 11 as a messianic passage. By his words, he will gather the outcasts of Israel all over the world and lift a standard for the nations. That's a messianic uh, draw. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of he will slay the wicked. That's, a, again... It echoes from Isaiah 11 or even a Revelation. By his word, the heavens were made. Now, that's an interesting verse, probably the most interesting of all of them, because he's alluding to the Messiah as divine, as the creator. The idea that the Messiah is God is not something that they're normally very comfortable with. A quote from Isaiah 53, too, is applied to the Messiah. That's not a chapter applied to the Messiah by conventional Judaism. This is the fascinating one. He indicated that accepting the Messiah is easier for those who do not keep the Torah. Wow, that's an interesting verse. It echoes from Isaiah 9.1. And he has all kinds of quotes from Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12, ascribing them as messianic. And so this is a big deal. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you and I would agree with everything that he happened to believe, but his departure and his notes and, and, and his legacy have rattled the ultra-Orthodox community in Judaism. Now, for some of us, we want to watch and see, but this may be the beginning of the blindness being lifted from the nation that Paul talks about in Romans 11.25. Let's move back to Herod here. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So apparently the wise men could have arrived to visit a substantial period after, or maybe it was within a year and he added a year to be safe. You know, who knows? That, uh, uh, we can just speculate on that. But then was fulfilled that which was spoken of by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, Lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. And this is Matthew applying that verse as a fulfilled prophecy. It's in Jeremiah 31. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And so Matthew sees that as being fulfilled in the butchering, the massacre, the butchery of, of Bethlehem. When Rachel had her son and she died in childbirth, she named him Benoni, which is the son of my sorrow. But Jacob then immediately renamed him um, uh, Benjamin, son of my right hand. The Messiah is called the man of sorrow in Isaiah 53. That's what it spells out. But Psalm 2, the Father speaks of him as son of my right hand. Both are specifically in the Scripture pointing to the Messiah. Well, when, Her but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he rose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he'd heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. 
So he's up north. He's not in Judea. He's up, up, up in north. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's interesting how Matthew continually ties what's his chronicle of what's going on with the Old Testament pro prophecies, and some of the prophecies he ascribes gives us a lesson in hermeneutics. There's a very sound teaching in hermeneutics that you should, context, you should never quote something out of context, and that's certainly very true. And yet you begin to realize that Matthew violated that continually when the context justified it, uh, when the situation justified it. And uh, so he's called a Nazarene. That term actually implies in, com in the common vernacular an ignorant man. And it's partly because it was a, a virtually a Gentile area up north and a fig the figure of speech implied contempt. And also, netzer is a branch or sprout or shoot. There's a pun here of, of sorts, a sprout that grows out from a stump. And that's what that, the netzer is, a branch is called, and it, that's the term used in Isaiah 11 too. I'm going to suggest to you that these are intended puns. That's a, that, a, a, a pun is a deliberate connotative transfer. And uh, I, give, I give one for my computer friends. You all know what a kilobyte is. You know what a gigabyte is. And what a terabyte is. Well, what's a moabyte? Well, it's a lot, you see. Now, it's, if you pick up on that, the idea that I deliberately did, I deliberate did a connotative transfer, but here I did it as a pun, usually for humor. Holy Spirit uses puns all through the Scripture to, well, you make a deliberate connotative transfer, and you'll find those in Jeremiah 33, 15, and Zechariah 6, 12, and elsewhere. One of these idioms is tzemek, which is a branch. There are 12 different words for branch in the Hebrew. The branch of the Lord is the term used in Isaiah 14, 2. He's the royal king from the line of David in Jeremiah 23, 5. And in Jeremiah 33, a repeat of the same thing. In Zechariah 3, 8, he's called the servant of... In each case, the word semek is used. He will, he's the one that's going to build the temple. And over 20 words that are translated branch, only one of them, semek, is used exclusively of the Messiah. In uh, Jeremiah 33, 15, in those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch, the semek, of righteousness to grow up into, unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. The branch of righteousness. Zechariah 6, 12, and 13. Now speak to him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the, name, the, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. The name, the one whose name is the branch. Well, it's interesting that if you study the Matzeroth, there are 12 signs. We call them the Zodiac because we follow the Babylonian tradition. But the Hebrew tradition is the Matzeroth. And of these, all, we know that all the stars have a name. That's mentioned in Psalm 147 and also in Isaiah 40. Can you imagine? We, the, the number of stars in the heavens is beyond our imagining, beyond our ability to really represent them numerically. And they all have a name. <laughs> they all have a name. The word Zodiac that we use comes from Sodi, the way. The way. That's what the Christian path was called in the book of Acts, called the way. Well, that's, that's what the signs in the heaven originally were called. Most of our information, the oldest information we have from secular sources, is the Temple of Dendera, about 2000 BC, about 3000 years ago, 4000 years ago. And uh, so in that we have a zodiac. And that's where we get, the, we, under, we have our understanding of how they saw it, but that's. Uh, that's the secular picture. Psalm 19, we should remind ourselves, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the ferment showeth his handiwork. And we're going to find this whole thing is littered with idioms of, from the information sciences. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which as a, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race, is going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit to the ends of it. 
And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. Some people say, well, gee, that's obviously archaic because we know the sun doesn't go around the earth. No, that's not what it says. It says it goes from one end of heaven to the other. The fact that we are going through around our whole galaxy every 25,000 years is missed by them unless they've had some astronomy. That's exactly what is consistent with what we have here. But the first of those signs, the 12 signs, which if you know the names in Hebrew, spell out the plan of God from the virgin birth to the triumph of the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first sign in our vernacular is called Virgo, or the Virgin. It's associated with the tribe of Zebulun, by the way, where Nazareth is located, interestingly enough. And if you learn the names of the stars in the order of brightness by their Hebrew names, it spells out a story. It's not, the, the pictures to remind you of the story, or put it the other way around, if you know the names of the stars in Hebrew, in order, it suggests the story, and the picture is depicted is what the story depicts. It's not that the stars look like a woman there carrying a... Uh, well, let's go look at this. The Alpha, the brightest star, is Spica, which means an ear of corn. In the Hebrew, though, the Hebrew name for that, that's the Greek name, the Hebrew name is Tzemek, the branch. One of the 20 words used exclusively of the Messiah. And the Arabic and Egypt, they have similar terms, if you will. The seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15... It's interesting that the virgin has a branch in her right hand and an ear of corn in her left. And Jesus explains that in John 12, that unless the ear of corn die, it will not you know, come up and so forth. So, tzara is the seed. The, uh, and the seed is singular, not plural, by the way. Big thing, big thing of made of that in Galatians chapter 3. Tzemek is the branch. It speaks really of the dual nature, God and yet despised. And uh, the, 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 uh, the insight in the double nature of the, uh, of the, of the, that's hinted at here is even hinted at in the mythology that surrounds this constellation. The double nature is embedded in the idea that sin offering of the despised one at the same time being a ruling king. That's the dual, duality that's going on here. What's fascinating is with modern telescopes, they've discovered that Zemeck is, in fact, a double star. If you have optics good enough, it wasn't until 1893 they found that that star is one of these double stars, that Zemeck is a double star. I think that's kind of interesting. Branch of the Lord, royal king, line of David, a servant of Jehovah, he'll build the temple. And okay. Let me shift for a minute and just get, to give you a quick glimpse of another little, a little tangent that I think you might find provocative for our little study here. Uh, we have, as you know, gone several times to Egypt uh, and, uh, uh, and Ethiopia. And uh, uh, Ethiopia is what I, uh, really what I, I want to emphasize here. This is where we were with a, a trusted friend there, Ms. Ghana. And there's a documented tradition that the, that the Ark of the Covenant went to Alephantine Island in 642 B.C., and then to town of Kirkus Island and Lake Tana. This is documented in 2 Chronicles 35, really, and I won't get into all that here, other than from there it went to Axum and is presently at St. Mary's Zion Church. And because of all this, uh, and they believe that, they're, they're, that this is their commitment to present this to the Messiah when he rules on Mount Zion. And there's Zephaniah 3.10, the whole chapter in Isaiah that deals with that presentation. But the main point is what we did is we actually retraced those steps and we went to the Elephantine Island, which was the capital of Egypt in the days that the Levites fled for refuge under Pharaoh Necho, in, who was Pharaoh of Egypt, but he actually was Ethiopian. And uh, so it's a for, it was the fortified capital back then. And we were actually there. It was an early advanced outpost, and uh, I won't go through all the background here, but we do have archaeological evidence that the tabernacle was set up there uh, from 525 to 404 B.C. in that, in that time, during the, prior to the Persian occupations. But we went then from there up to Lake Tana on to Tana Kirkus Island, where it remained for about 800 years. And it's that visit that I want to touch on because as we, and they're still using the same kind of uh, uh, canoe construction that is described in Isaiah 18, by the way. But there's Tana Kirkus Island. We were able to get on, uh, on the island. Even the Discovery Channel uh, had to get help from Bob Cornuk to, to get on that because they won't let anybody else on. But we saw the place where they hide all their, where they, I shouldn't say hide, they, they uh, you know, store all their uh, 
artifacts and things from those old days and, and uh, where, where they trafficked in the stuff. And, and uh, we even saw the places where apparently they actually set up the tabernacle there for a time. But the reason I'm bringing this up here is it was interesting to have them show us their Bible. And in their Bible, they record the visit of Joseph and Mary and the infant baby during that time that they had the sojourn in Egypt fleeing Herod. And that's in their Bible, interestingly enough. They, they, their claim is that they, they visited the town of Kirkus at that time, which would fit the, fit the, uh, the, uh, the story. And now they then went from, the, the ark went from there to Axum where it is today. And uh, so it, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. But one other final prophecy you might find provocative as we move from the birth into his young years. Um, Jacob gave a final prophecy in Genesis 49. He said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh being he to whose right it is. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It's a messianic passage that implies that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter really refers to the tribal identity and the right to apply Mosaic laws and so forth. And even when they were in captivity in Babylon, they were allowed to do that. Even during their seven-year Babylon captivity, they, they retained their tribal identity. They retained their own logistics, judges, and that sort of thing. But uh, the word Shiloh means he whose it is. And so it, the proper translation would be, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs, is what it really means to say. And it was understood as such by the early rabbis and Talmudic authorities all through the the uh, rabbinical literature. Well, the scepter departed from Judah. Herod the Great died. Herod Antipater had, had been murdered. Archelaus was appointed ethnarch by Caesar Augustus, badly rejected, dethroned, and banished. That's all in Josephus. Caponius was appointed procurator at this time. The legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted, and the adjudication of capital cases was lost. This was normal, Roman policy. All this is in Josephus, Wars of the Jews, chapter 2, verse 8, if you want to get into it. Well, here it is, in chapter 20 also. After the death of procurator Festus, when Albinus was about to succeed him, the high priest Ananias considered a favorable opportunity to assemble the Sanhedrin. He therefore caused James, the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ, that's all in Josephus, by the way, and several others to appear before his hastily assembled council and pronounced upon this, them the sentence of death by stoning. All the wise men and strict observers of the law who were at Jerusalem expressed their disappropriation of this act. So they didn't have the authority to do that. That's the point. That's what he's recording here. Some even went to Albinus himself who had departed to Alexandria to bring this breach of the law under his observation and to inform him that Irenaeus had acted illegally in assembling the Sanhedrin without Roman authority. The only point I'm making is they didn't have adjudication of capital crimes which they interpreted as the, as the, separate, the separate departs. So the priests did something very interesting. The Babylonian Talmud records this. They put on sackcloth and ashes and marched around the city saying, Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. They actually believed that the word of God had been broken and mourned that fact. What they didn't know is that while they were doing that, there was a young man in a carpenter shop in Nazareth learning a trade from his dad, I guess. So they believed the Word of God had failed, and there was a young boy growing up in Nazareth at that time. And he would present himself as Messiah, the King, the very day that had been predicted by the angel Gabriel five centuries earlier. That's all in Daniel 9.25 and so on. Okay, major lessons here. The Messianic line, of course, and the truth is in the details. One of the things that we learn by exploring all these things is that God always re uh, rewards the diligent student. Digging in behind these things often reveals a treasure we had no idea was there. And the precision of the God-breathed text, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word in the Greek is God-breathed. God-breathed. And hermeneutics, the theory of interpretation, we need to understand that pattern is also prophecy. We need to understand God's patterns. And uh, I want to show you, though, Something that surprised me to discover, because I never realized that Christ's childhood is recorded in the Word of God. The book of Psalms is the most quoted book in the New Testament, more than any other book in the Old Testament. And Jesus said that the Psalms spoke about him in Luke 24 and also in Psalm 40, verse 7. Um, 
And it turns out that they constitute irrefutable testimony to the divine inspiration of the Scriptures in many ways. And we won't go through all of those. There's a whole bunch of Messianic Psalms that will make this very clear, but we're going to focus on one that has a nuance that I had always missed. It's the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. Next to Psalm 22, it's the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 22 deals with the death of Christ. Psalm 69 deals with the life of Christ. And it's quoted in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts and Romans. So it's quoted a lot. The Psalm is quoted a lot. And there are also many references to it besides direct quotes beyond that. But it's, there is an allusion here to the early years. This psalm gives us a glimpse into the silent years, as they call them, of Christ's childhood and his young manhood, of which the Gospels tell us practically nothing. Now, there's that one little incident in Luke where he tells us about when he was 12, he was the temple. Most of us know that story. But other than that, we know very little about his childhood. This psalm fills in some details. We're going to see some of his dark days in Nazareth um, and his dark hours on the cross in this psalm. Now, it's classified as an imprecatory psalm because of the imprecatory prayer in it in verses 22 to 28. I'm not going to focus on that here on this particular occasion. It's from that section that most of the New Testament quotes are taken. His imprecatory, it's actually a cry for justice. And it's a psalm of his early humiliation and rejection. And for that reason, it's quoted a great deal. But we're going to begin up, at, up, up north in Nazareth. We're going to hear the heart sob of a small boy and a teenager and a young man. Let's read Psalm 69, verse, starting at verse 6. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek me be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. There are two reasons he's bearing this, of course, because they hated him for who he, of whom he was, and they came to take a lowly, humble place on the earth. That's pretty straightforward. For thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. But here we get a strange verse. Verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. What a strange phrase to use. You know, whenever you see an apparent unnecessary detail, that's what a rabbi will call a remez, a hint of something deeper. It's like a sign that says, dig here. You know? Mary had other children, right? That, we know that from the Gospels, right? We'll look at that in a minute, I think. He became an alien to his mother's children, not his father's children, because Joseph was not his father. They were half-brothers and half-sisters. I want you to visualize the reality of life in Nazareth when they were small kids. And they'd come home and say, gee, they don't know who Jesus' father is. His apparent illegitimacy was a common buzz about him and his mother. Let's understand what that means. Because you've got half-brothers and half-sisters who knew who their father was, right? I'm going to suggest to you this is a very unhappy home for 30 years. This verse, by the way, teaches the virgin birth. It's one reason I include it in this little survey. We know they had other children in Matthew 13, verse 35. Is not this, carpent is this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, his brethren, James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? They're named, four of them here. Now, I realize there's some church traditions that would deny this, but there it is in the Word of God. Check it out. In Mark also it says, Is not this the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, a brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas? And are not his sisters here with us? So we know he has four brothers, and he has at least two sisters. So it's apparently a family of seven children, maybe more. He continues here, verse 9, For the zeal of thine house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. That verse is quoted in the New Testament when he cleared the temple. Verse in John chapter 2, He found the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting, and when they had made a scourge of small scourges, he drove them out of the temple and sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. 
And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They linked that to Psalm 69. But let's continue to Psalm 69. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. So when he was pious, they made fun of him. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. Remember John chapter 8, when he's tangling with the Pharisees? And they say, well, we were not born of fornication. They threw his apparent illegitimacy in his face in John 8. Before that chapter finishes, he tells them about their parentage. Ye of your father the devil, and he goes on. That, that, that's a, John 8 is a, a, important to understand the tensions that are boiling up in that one. I made sackcloth also my garment, and became a proverb unto them. They that sit in the gate, that's like the city council, they, sit, they that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. The drunks of the town are making up ditties in the tavern about he and his mother. This is the way he's growing up. Now, you know how forgiving small towns can be, huh? Drunk, drunk as a barb. Dirty ditties about him and his mother. Why did he endure all this? We know we all talk about his enduring the cross, and indeed, don't miss, I'm, not, I don't mean, I'm not minimizing that in any way. All of us, I know, I have, I have overlooked the 30 years that he had to endure all this. He was raised in a town where he was called illegitimate. Why? In order that you and I might be a legitimate son of God. Son of God bore that for me on the cross. He paid the penalty for my sins. We have no idea what he endured for those 30 years as a child. Not a child going till he started his ministry. He did all that so that we would have clear title as a legitimate son of God throughout eternity. Let me finish by summarizing him a little bit more. He is the king of the Jews. We forget that he's Jewish. When we celebrate his birth, we need to realize he's, he was born Jewish. He's a national person. He's a king of Israel. And he's king of all the ages, the king of heaven, king of glory, king of kings, lord of lords. And the real question this season, do you know him? Do you really know him? He's a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor even above Solomon. He was beloved, then rejected, then exalted, son like Joseph, yet far more than that. The heavens declare his glory, and the firmament shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau, the A and the Z. The first fruits of them that slept. He is the ego I me, the ichyach asher ichyach, the I am that I am. Yes, he was the voice of the burning bush. He was the captain of the Lord's host, despite what the song says about Joshua. He was the conqueror of Jericho. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, and he's also our avenger of blood. He's our city of refuge, our performing high priest, our personal prophet, and our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism, and he's the miracle of all the ages, the superlative of everything good. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. They say he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him all things are held together. Well, the question is, what held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. 
At any time, he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. What held him to that cross? It was his love for you and me. He was born of a woman so that we could be born of God. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He serves the unfortunate. He sympathizes and he saves. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. He's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but soon learned they couldn't stop him. Pilate could not find any fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. He has always been and always will be. He had no predecessor and he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him and he ain't going to resign. His name is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen indeed. Let's close our, with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this incredible gift you've given us, this extreme that you've gone to that we might have life. Oh, Father, we pray that through your Holy Spirit and through your word that we might more fully comprehend what it is that you would have of us in response, that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities you've given us, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of him and that we might be more pleasing in thy sight as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, in whose name we do pray. Amen.